Hey everyone, welcome to the Wicked Ones Podcast. This is Jen. And this is Tara. And how are you on this fine day? Yeah, not too bad. Still cold. Oh my gosh. Still it freezing. Ends. Yeah, it's still, I just, you know, I kind of want to just be sitting by a fire when we do this sometimes. <laughs> I, yeah, I, well, and I'm an introvert. We all know that. Mm-hmm. I'm an extroverted introvert. Mm-hmm. So I don't mind the cold. Like, we can't go anywhere. And I hate Like, storage. oh darn. Yeah, but yeah. we've been just not doing anything for so long. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Mm-hmm. No, there is. You can't take any satisfaction in a snow day. No, no. Now I'm like, oh god, we're all stuck in the house <laughs> together again. Yeah. Here we go again. Yeah. Well, but this episode will drop in March, and people are probably starting to think about spring break, which we are for our stories as well. Yes. And I'm wondering what people are doing. I mean, I know people are still going to Disney and. I hear a there lot of people are going to be traveling. Yeah. Um, Flights are going up. A lot of people up. are getting vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that's good. I know. We are going to travel. Yeah. We're going to Florida. We, we are too. Yes, we're going. Well, Billy and I are going. My parents are coming to watch the kiddos and we're going to a wedding in Key West, which I've never been to Key West. It's so, so fun. I'm it's beautiful. Excited. It's Nickel Fest. Oh my gosh. I can't wait to hear and see the pictures. Mm -hmm. You're going to have fun. Chris and Emily, can't wait. Congratulations. Congrats. We're counting down. Can't wait to celebrate with you. That's awesome. Yeah, Yeah. we're just going to go to Steve's parents' house in Florida. So I feel like it's pretty, you know, obviously the airplane, but they pick us up at the airport. We're not in front of the car and we just hang out at their house. Yeah. They have a pool. Very low key. So um, we're not doing any like amusement parks or nothing. We'll just. As far as I know, we're staying at house there with a few other couples and that's it yeah so it's like you guys have a great time yeah okay i have to ask and if anybody has an opinion on this please write in but they're getting married on saint patrick's day do i do i wear green do i wear a green dress to the wedding do i just wear a little bit of green what do i do i know we've had this discussion (laughs) i don't know i I don't know what's right right i told you i ordered stitch fix and trunk club which and we're going to review after this. Yes. I haven't even opened them. They're sitting downstairs. I can't wait. Yeah. And That's... remember the trunk? They tried to send me, like, all this crazy oh satin God. and, like, that one dress, green dress. I mean, I would look like a very... And the cosmic t-shirt with the arm yeah. pads or the shoulder pads. Yeah. That was... I... Clearly, we're out of mm-hmm. the loop on fashion. Cause yeah. Because I haven't needed anything more than scrubs and Mm-mm. my podcasting clothes. Yeah. So, they were the ones that made me think, like... Oh, shit, I need to wear green, I guess. Yeah, they did. So maybe That's I, funny. Yeah. Well, I am team green. I think Tara should wear green. Green looks good on her. And Aww, thanks. since Chris and Emily love St. Patrick's Day, I think she should wear green. So yeah. she's going to put up that poll on everybody vote. What if I just dress up like a leprechaun and surprise oh. everybody? <laughs> so uh, stay tuned. Maybe together. I'll share that picture. <laughs> um, Otherwise, yeah. so... I'm excited for the story you have for me today. You yeah. haven't told me any details. It was, it was rough coming up with a spring break story that has not been told one million times. But guess what? I have one for you today that has not been told. At least that I haven't seen. I haven't seen this one out there at all. And I thought, you know what? This story is interesting because I know nothing of train hoppers. Do you know anything about train hoppers? Are you? No. You're tell about, me. You're about ready to find out. The reason that I chose this story was actually threefold. Most heavily, though, due to the fact that I am, I'm honestly just tired of hearing all the negative talk about the police force in general and the defund the police. Like, stop it. We don't need to do that. That is not a good idea. We, just, we, no, I, I, I don't think we need to defund the police. We, the bad cops need to go. Mm hmm. Sure. 100%. Mm-hmm. But, but we need the police. But we need the police. I need people to help me. Yeah. Yeah. I, the police help us so much at, at my work. I mean, I can't imagine if we didn't have them. They're always at our hospital helping. And true crime community, who are who is going to solve all these cases? Because you know what? We don't, we're not out there running down leads and looking in and, and you know, talking to witnesses and solving these cases. I'm Somebody just, has to do this first. I'm telling you about what everyone else has done. Yeah, we are. And today, the story that I chose is a really good, and it's a really good positive one 
for law enforcement. And I thought, you know what? I'm so tired of hearing all these people saying, oh, they did such a bad job or they botched this or they did. And you know what? Sometimes it does need to be said because if they did a bad job, yeah, that needs to be recognized and they need to keep digging. Sure. But I just wanted to share something that was a little more positive that really shows boots to the ground, people who are committed to finding justice when it doesn't look like it's possible. I mean, the case that I have for you today is one that looked very bleak. Tell me, tell me. I'm dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Normally I know a little tiny bit. This one I don't, you didn't tell me anything. Mm -mm. No, and I'm just not going to tell you until I get into it. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Um, So yeah, so that and then, and then the other two reasons that I had or that I just, one, I couldn't find any other podcast that took on this case. And so I do feel that the story of John Paul Alpert have you heard of him? I know the last name. Okay. He was a sweet, selfless kid. He had very little money, but dreamed of seeing the world. And I just feel like his story deserves to be told and what happened. And that, along with the dangers of train hopping. Because I knew nothing about this, but about the culture of train hopping. Do you know anything about it? No. I mean, I always thought of it back as... I think of like boxcars. Yes, exactly. And I think a lot of people do. Um, you know, there's just a lot of dangers with train hopping and the whole underground society. And honestly, before this, previously, I... I didn't know there was an underground society, so I'm learning I already. I kind of thought it was, like, illegal. I didn't think that it was... And I think it is. In most places, it's it's illegal, but people still do it. Um, I have to hear more. I have to hear how this happens. Yeah. And I just feel like, you know, it'd be kind of interesting to shed a light, you know, a light on this type of lifestyle as well during my story. It sounds and very scary. Yeah, well, it's super dangerous. It's just... Not for a 6.5. No, (laughs) no. And it's not for uh, any high school kids looking to take an adventure on spring break. Oh, By themselves. Oh, no. Yeah. Anything by yourself is not good. No. You always need a buddy. You need a buddy. I know. And that's another part of my story that's very sad, and we'll get into it. So I'm going to tell you first about the discovery of the body. And then I'm going to follow that up with the backstory on how this tragic misadventure began. And then I'm going to wind you through the details of the case and how it took four years of hard work and the involvement of several law enforcement agencies to bring the killers who were virtually traveling ghosts to justice. Okay. We both took the same spin this time. We did, didn't we? We were like, <laughs> yeah, we take too long to tell our story. I'm yeah. going to tell you it in the beginning. I'm going to tell you in the beginning. Well, and because I just think it's interesting to find out what just to kind of see it for what it was that the police had to work with and mm-hmm. then learn the story of what happened first, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So May 15th, 2013, Roseville, California's police department is contacted by a fisherman who claims to have found a body near Dry Creek, not too far from a platform train crossing in a switchyard where you could hear, you know, the freight trains passing through. So you can kind of imagine what it, what that looks like. Upon arrival, Detective Vince Dutto sees the crime scene text near the body, and it's in advanced stages of decomp. So with this, you know, there's insects, the skin looks mummified, the legs were skeletal at this point. They could conclude that it had been there for a few months. So as he's starting to process the scene, he knew it looked suspicious, but he couldn't see any obvious signs that it could be labeled a homicide. I mean, the body in this kind of state, I'm sure it's not. It's never easy. Mm -mm. But he knew this area as well, you know, which was right next to like a hidden underpass. And of course, by where all the trains are, it's where all the transient and train hoppers would come to squat for a few days at a time. There's graffiti on, um, you know, on the little cement braces underneath the bridge. Some of them would, you know, almost like a, a gang of sorts, the FTRA, they would leave their mark, the Freight Train Riders of America, or there'd be like symbols or signs. Oh, wow. of This is where you can, you know... This is like your place, like this yeah. is a safe, I don't want to say safe, but almost like here you can catch this train or yeah. I think they yeah. had just symbols. Almost like that a warning, not a warning, but a, yeah, like you said, a signal. Like yeah, just warning, like you this is the next could, one or, sure. Like, yeah. oh, people come here, or you can you know what I've I mean. done this, so you should try it or you yeah. could try it. Yeah, it worked for me, kind of a thing. It's just I very underground, saying. you know, it's like a very underground lingo that I didn't I didn't really get into all of that, but some of it. So it was time to remove the body from its location bring it in for further processing. The local coroner toe tags the body and they carry away John Doe number 35. So as an autopsy was attempted the very next day, it was determined that by pulling and scraping away the tissue, potential evidence could be destroyed. So they stopped the exam. 
and using the best protocol that they had, they shipped the remains to Chico State's Human Identification Lab. And this is where I geek out, like at some of the ways that they yeah, I'm getting figure excited out what's right going now. on, right? So Professor Eric Bartolink, one of the greatest minds in his field and recognized by the FBI as part of the top forensic anthropologist team in California, was able to take on the challenges of the body, right? And like that it presented and try to keep everything intact so they could determine what really happened. He puts the body in an aquarium of dermistid beetles. So like these beetles mm-hmm. are basically just doing the job for it. And that means you know, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're eating everything away. So they took some time to do their work. They were able to clean everything off the bones. They could be examined further and there wouldn't be any confusion, you know, made by the human hand of, you know, I I imagine like tools that they use or pulling could probably really mess up some of these fragile. So what is it? What does the beetle all eat? I mean, everything, I think. It's all the flesh. Yeah. It didn't say, but it just. Sounds like it because you said the bones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because there wasn't, there really wasn't like clothing or anything like that. Like stuff. Mm -hmm. It was more just tissue and bone. Mm -hmm. And it, fa- it this fascinates me because one of the shows I used to watch all the time was Bones. Do you ever watch that show? Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if you'd like it or not. It's very, it's different. Like the the anthropologist, like the main anthropologist, she's just a very different personality. But I think you would appreciate her because she was just super scientific. She was almost one that didn't really get any humor at all. She was just like, wait, what? Like yeah. She was very matter of fact and straightforward and super smart. And I just, I always just, they always had these cool cases like this where they had to like figure out a way to discover who this person was oh it's it's you gotta huh. maybe you should check it out it's kind of fun i have to look it up very different though like a little more lighthearted show versus some of the other ones that are maybe a little darker so um and i i actually remember an episode where they use this very same method so i was like oh so i could like picture it because i saw the episode and i'm like oh i remember it was i gross, remember hearing but... something like this before mm-hmm. yeah it might have been like blacklist i mean I don't oh I, right like they, one of those shows yeah they, i don't yeah. think it was a real show but mm-hmm. I yeah. remember being down that road. Which is interesting to know that all the different ways that they can oh, go about. I just don't do bugs, so that no, just screws bugs me out. Are... But I get, but that's pretty <laughs> cool. But it is cool. Um, so while Detective Dotto was waiting on Bartleding's findings, he received a call from a forensic dentist positively identifying the remains of their John Doe. He was, in fact, a missing Southern, uh, Southern California team named John Paul Albert. Um, and I don't, I don't think I wrote this down, but they lived in Palmdale, so Southern California. So they identified him from his teeth. They did. So Dutto, Detective Dutto immediately calls his family and speaks with his mother, Cecilia. And this is what he found out. John was a devoted, selfless, hardworking kid. Just a real good kid. He was an honor student. He had volunteered to take classes at the local community college so he could stay home and take care of his disabled parents. So... I'm sure he wanted that college experience, but he gave that up because, you know, he loved mm-hmm. his parents and he wanted to be there. And he often volunteered his time as well to feed the homeless. So at 19, you know, he's this bright kid with a, with a bright future. And although he took his duties at home very seriously, he still had dreams. You know, he couldn't shake the wanderlust that he had. He knew that he wanted to travel. He wanted to see the world. But, you know, when, when you don't have a lot of money, it's hard to imagine how you're going to make that dream come true especially when you're in that situation you know? oh yeah it's travel is not it's not cheap. cheap it's not easy it's you know so I think this might be even more common than we think for people to just try these maybe riskier behaviors so they can try to do the things that they you know to travel and see the things they want to see get that freedom mm-hmm. you know so one day in March as spring break was approaching John was heading on his bike to Barnes & Noble. So he's a big reader, as most dreamers are. I'm sure you're not surprised. And on his way, he saw four train hoppers standing by a field with their two dogs. And he couldn't help but stop and chat with them. I'm it's sure. Just so you. <laughs> right? I'd be making... I'm... Riding your bike like, oh, hey, what are you guys doing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. I totally would. <laughs> I don't think I would, like, go on a train hopping adventure with them, but... No, but you would have to figure it out. Yeah, I would have, I have to have questions. So... He was currently reading Siddhartha, which is a novel by Herman Hess of self-discovery. And he had questions for these directors, right? I mean, I'm sure, you know, when people get involved in some of these older novels, Mm -hmm. too, they're just like, oh, just to be wander through the woods and not have any, you know, material possessions and just, you know, Mm -hmm. it seems so romantic and they They start like, yeah, idealistic. Right. You Mm -hmm. don't think about all of the negative things that go on. Like you need a blanket. Right. 
Yeah. <laughs> right. Where are you going to brush your teeth? Where yeah. Are you going to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, where are you going to get your food? It's like yeah. a nightmare. I'm like, ah, like, I, know, I think right? about it. And I just start twitching. <laughs> right. Well, for you, you're like, oh, you have to have those planned out. We're doing this at 9 a.m. We're yeah. going to going on. I'm like, so, what are you talking about? Yeah. So, like, definitely not for you. But <laughs> for people that can just head off on an adventure and figure it out as they go. I have a girlfriend like that. She was very gypsy-like. Yeah. And it was, it, it, I was always fascinated and even envious because mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not built that way. So I can't. Yeah. Oh, I have to have, I know exactly what you mean. The people that just think they can show up at your door and just be like, hey, what's going on? I'm staying with you for the weekend. And you're like, yeah, what? she used to do that. And I'm yeah. like, I'm on call all weekend. You need a phone first. My grandma was kind of like that. Like, yeah. She's like, oh, that's stupid. Don't go. And I'm like, no, it's a job. Like, you yeah. have to go. There's no, like. But I'm here. We're ready to party. abandonment. Like, yeah. it's not. Yeah. It's kind of a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, he approaches these, um, these people. And he talks with them about their adventures traveling the countryside. And he wants to know what it's like to live the way that they do. To be free to go where they please. And um, it's something he'd always wondered about. And. Again, wondering if he could do it on very little money. You know, well, maybe I could do this too. So he came home excited about the possibilities ahead. And he told his family that he was going to ride the rails with this group that he had met for a few weeks before classes started back up. Okay. I know. I know. I see your face. <laughs> he wanted his twin brother, Go to Josh. your room. I know. I was like, no, oh, this is okay. Maybe they just all had a very open mind about these things. I don't know. Because his family seemed to be okay with it. Some that are just very trustworthy. Yeah, you know. So he want, He said he wanted, to, or it was said that he wanted his brother, his twin brother, Josh, to accompany him. His twin brother. But Josh was working really hard on his computer science midterms coming up, and so he decided to pass. A decision, of course, he would later regret. But, you know, with these things, you he couldn't have known what was going to happen. And After hearing the rest of the story, maybe you'll agree with me that there's a very good chance they both might not have made it I was back. just going to say, he... Yeah. He might not have been able to protect him. Mm -hmm. I really don't think, I think that's a very real possibility. So John left the next day. He promised to call or text his parents every day. And he kept his word. He, He always kept in touch, let him know everything he was doing. Until March 17th, when all communication stopped. His last text let his mother know that he was on the outskirts of Roseville. And then he was going to go to Nevada next. And then he would take a bus home. So it was kind of at the end of his trip. He sent a message to his brother Josh as well, telling them he would see him very soon, and then he had found what he was looking for. So, after this, again, he was never heard from until Detective Dutto had reached out you know, later that summer to give the family the worst possible news that he wouldn't be coming. So it was from March until... Um, yes, he was discovered in May. So, a couple months. Uh, and then, well, and then, of course... They had to go through the whole process right, of the identifying process, right. the body. Yeah. So, oh, to put it down, I want to say it was like August. Like yeah, it was months. Yeah, it, it was. was a, it took a while. A it took six weeks to identify his bones from there. So, yeah, later on and toward fall. A week after contacting the Alberts, Detective Dutto received word that the body was ready to be examined. So, again, this was about six weeks. They had found hinge fractures on three ribs, blunt force trauma to the lumbar vertebrae, along with fractures on his skull on the left and right nasal bones. So it could be determined that these injuries took place before and at the time of death. Or while snowmobiling. Oh, God. I couldn't control myself. All you can think about is Steve's broken nose. Yeah. Yeah. This is why you don't snowmobile. Oh. I can't wait for you to see his face. You're going to be so mad that Billy bought one, but go on. Sorry. He tried to tell me it wasn't a big deal, by the way. I was like, I heard Steve, like, really fucked up his face. <laughs> he was like, what? He hasn't even told me. He's like, I'm like, what do you mean he hasn't no, even told you? he's not going to tell anybody. Yeah. I walked around with a broken hand for a week. You don't talk about those things. No, especially not when you're supposed to go with your friend that very day to go get his very own snowmobile. <laughs> you Sorry, just don't. Not like... <laughs> no. So anyway, back to the story. Um... So it could be determined that these injuries took place before or at the time of death, and Bartolink also determined that these injuries were consistent with being kicked or stomped to death. Ugh. Yeah. It was at this point that Dutto teamed up with another police officer, um, another police detective, sorry, in Roseville, Mary Green. She was said to be a very hard worker and was known for her encyclopedic memory of the case files, so she totally reminds me of, like, Reed from Criminal Minds, who mm. was my favorite. That's awesome. 
So the two then also meet up with a local prosecutor, the Placer County Deputy, uh, Deputy District Attorney, Doug Van Bremen. And I know it's not easy, but I'll help you remember everyone's rules throughout because it, sometimes it takes a village, right, when they're when they're working on these things. And thank God everybody was super helpful and ready to do whatever needed to, to be done. To work together because yeah. that's not always the case. Exactly, which is just great. So even with their help, Dado realized that they were starting at zero. They had nothing to go on. The hoppers he was with, they would be long gone and anywhere in the country. Take a guess. Throw, you know, throw a stone on a map. You never know where they could be. And they only had one name to go on. Laura was the only name John mentioned before he took off with the group. No last name, nothing else. So they just know that one of these people he was with was named Laura. So if that's not, you know, yeah, that's... nothing to go on. It's important to note here a little history. Roseville is also home. <laughs> this is where I was like, oh, Jenna's going to really I like this I just part. perked up. Did you see me? I'm like, <laughs> a little bit of history. <laughs> so Roseville is also home to the second largest switchyard on the West Coast. The life of a train hopper, though, it can seem wildly exciting and adventurous, as I mentioned. You know, I guess if you're into that sort of thing, which I would take a hard pass on. It's also very dangerous and it has a very dark history attached to it. So back in the early 50s, there were several murders committed in isolated train yards. And one of the murders took place locally in Roseville. The papers started dubbing him the Jungle Killer. His real name was Lloyd Gomez. He was using these pockets of train yards as his personal hunting ground for boxcar riders in the Depression era, which is what you were thinking of, the boxcar riders mm -hmm. or hobos, as many people mm -hmm. Recognize that name given to transients back in the day. They were, obviously, everybody's heard the, the name Hobo. Another well-known murderer from the area, Robert Joseph Silvera Jr., he was even worse. He was known as Sidetrack. During my reading also up on, on train hopping and that life, it's really, it was, what I found was it was very common for everyone to have some kind of nickname. Like I was you, just going to say that. Yeah, everybody had like a, like a street name, you know? I don't know if it's something to make them seem tougher or maybe just get away from their old identity. Maybe a little bit of both, but you know, everybody had, had like a name. So this particularly unhinged man was convicted of four brutal murders in three states and also implicated in 23 more. And he was eventually captured right there in Placer County in 1996, not far from Roseville. I wanted to mention these cases and also just clarify that it's a well-known fact that crimes are common among the community of people that choose this lifestyle. So although the biggest risks by far were from falling off the trains or being crushed between the cars, which that's scary enough. But fights are also common when people were injured. Mm. The police were just, they were hardly ever notified. I'm sure this comes to no surprise to you. Yeah, no. I, that's Nobody's exactly calling the cops. Yeah. <laughs> no. So just remember that. And, and one other thing, I didn't write it down, but I thought it was interesting that Roseville was actually listed as one of the best places in California to live. Safest. So that's also interesting. Probably because as long as you stay away from... Yeah. You know? That watch lifestyle. that risky behavior. They were saying that it was more property theft and things like that that was like a problem, but it wasn't so much murder or anything like that. So interesting. So back to the investigation. Another Roseville officer by the name of David Flood had become an expert of sorts on this particular community. He mentioned that in his time spent in these areas near the rails, he ran into a lot of high school runaways or college age kids that were just looking for, you know, a journey, a great adventure, freedom. I could see that. Yeah, right? I mean, that's kind of what we speculated. Mm -hmm. So this guy has become an expert of sorts, right? He, he was saying that the peace, like, these are the peaceful people that you might think of, the ones that are looking for that freedom. You know, they're, they're busking, they're begging in the cities. They're meeting up with like by the like-minded individuals that they they know at the music festivals and other mm -hmm. gatherings. Like these are you can the, see it. right. Like you can you know when we would go to some of these music festivals, mm -hmm. the type that we would see and we'd be like, oh, that's mm -hmm. which is very free, very mm -hmm. gypsyish, very comfortable, just yeah, being nomadic, wherever. Yeah, yeah, like the nomadic lifestyle for sure. But then you also have the criminals that have taken to this life um, and live on the down low, basically because they're on the run. They are. I mean, this is like survival mode for mm -hmm. them. They basically need to stay off the grid or they face jail time. So riding the rails, like I said, is literally like, you know. Life or death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are the ones that are trying to outrun warrants. And they pretty much prey on anyone they see fit. He spent years cultivating relationships and immersing himself into this subculture of train riders. He was in contact with so many of them. He was even mentioned in like the secret underground pamphlet known as the crew change, which I thought was interesting. I, and I mentioned it only because... 
gives you an idea of how hard these officers work, literally boots on the ground to get there in with these people so they can get information when it's vitally needed. And right now it was needed. So he, you know, Dutto and Green working this case, they ask him to keep his eyes open and his ear to the ground for them. It's crazy that there's a person who does this because I had no idea it was like even. Right. I mean, it makes me thing. think back to, of course, I just relate so many things to movies, but it makes me think back to, you know, movies where people go underground and they are in with like the drug mm-hmm. dealers or the, the street gangs or whatever so that they can like get the information or be a part of. Yeah. Yeah. Sting I mean, operations. Exactly what you're stuff. saying. And I'm like, wow. And that's part of some tree hopping. They have, like, yeah. Crazy. So they have a guy that does this. It's so cool. It's really interesting to me. I mean, all of it's just very like, wow. Okay. Like, how do you get that job? <laughs> you know? Um, so now you have flood hanging out and asking all these questions. And he's trying to learn what he can from the people that were there. If they knew this kid, if they knew anything, anything. And then you have Mary green, our female read character over here with the amazing brain researching the hell out of everything that she can. So one of her strengths, she spent, she spends countless hours online in the rail writer forums, looking for any clue that she could find. So she just, she is a researcher. She is give her up something to find and she will get online and find it. Hmm. She found some really gross things too. I totally had to mention because now that I know them, I have to share them so you can be grossed oh. out too. But some of these criminals would even cultivate body bugs. I know bugs, it's not your thing. So that when patrol officers would come across them, they wouldn't want to touch them to search mm-hmm. them. Yeah. So in this way, they could effectively hide drugs, which is super gross, right? I could see that. Ugh. But like, yeah. Like they the get lane... patients with body bugs. Oh, oh, you probably do. So that was not, I mean, it's gross, but it wasn't, probably didn't have the same effect. Oh, it didn't. That you were hoping I was for. hoping for a little shock. I know. I was like, yeah, I know. You're like, oh yeah, no, wait, I just dealt with that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but right? It's insane to me. The lengths that people will go to you to... to avoid yeah yeah wow Mm -hmm. green also went through the tapes from barnes and noble looking for any sign of these four people and it was a dead end but they they didn't give up they just kept looking when john first disappeared his mother went through his phone records too she started calling all the numbers that were coming up and this elusive laura was one that finally answered and when she found out it was john's mom she was really awful toward her She said, and I quote, he took off and he's probably fucking some hippie chick. She screamed at her. She said, I don't know where he is. Leave me alone. And hung up. Mm, So I don't believe her. mm, No. And neither did they. She she had also told Josh. So apparently he had attempted to contact her. And he described, and I quote, she said that he was an alcoholic and she wasn't his babysitter. She said he was a little kid. So Josh is completely taken aback by what she was saying. So was his family, and this made them very suspicious. This happened before they knew that it was that he when they, before they found the body, they were trying to to figure this out, and they made these phone calls. Okay, this is what made them suspicious that something might have happened to mm-hmm. him, and that's why, you know. So, one of John's friends also took the liberty to scour Laura's Facebook page. Her name, Scary Laura Rax. So I wonder, I didn't, I didn't actually go on Facebook to see if she was still there or not, but I didn't, I didn't actually have time to get into that, but yeah, so that's her, that's her Facebook page. So apparently, even though you're a train hopper and you live a transient lifestyle, you still you go to the library to use the internet, but you still, probably their phones, because they have phones. They're probably, how taking, do they pay their phone bill? I have no idea. So many I mean, questions. they have jobs, but I don't know how you hold a job when you're just like all over the place. I know. I have questions, too. That, I'm sure that no one can see the puzzled look on my face, but I, <laughs> You're like, I'm so Wait a trying to put everything this together in my head. So this friend sends the, the link of her Facebook page to Detective Dutto, and the detectives start digging. They spend more countless hours over the next several weeks exploring every single nook and cranny in the page, right? They click on every friend link, every photo tag, mm-hmm. meticulously documenting their way through her social network, which is awesome. Because bingo, a photo of Laura at the crime scene. She was standing by the creek bed, the bridge, the graffiti, all of that in the background. So, you know, you can kind of, you can see clearly this is where his body was found. She was standing with a tall male, messy hair, hard, rough looking facial features. And this was Jules Carrillo. There was a strong looking, burly woman with dreadlocks, 
this was Charity Ann Williams, or as she was known as Agro. I told you everybody has like a lot of these people have nicknames. I don't know what Agro was supposed to be like short for. I, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine there. But and then there was another thin boy with a blonde mullet, and he had like star tattoos by his eyes. Ooh. And this face tattoos always scare yeah, me. Face tattoos, right? You're yeah, right. Um, so this was Edo or Edward Anao. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name right. I really did try to find some videos on all this just so I could hear somebody pronounce some of these names. That's that's what I'm going to say, though. Well, so we'll just call him Edo from now on. And on Facebook, he called himself himself Still Edo. So it makes me think of, like, the shoes. Like, Stiletto, Still Edo. I don't know. He hasn't changed yet? I I'm not sure. Like, Still Edo. Right. I couldn't figure it out. Different. I was like, what was he doing? So He has a weird sense of humor, that guy. Could be. So it was determined that... John Albert must have been the one who took that photo, right? Because there's before them, so who took the picture? So was, they're like, well, it was probably John. Dotto contacts Laura Kenner by phone. They find out her last name. And I should note, too, that he also had a warrant for cell tower data on her number, revealing that she had attempted to check the balance on a gift card that had belonged to John. They locked all their cell, cell numbers on it. They got all the data on it. At this point, they can't hear anything that they're saying, right. but they can... But they can figure out where their phones are. They can are. figure out where they are. They were at a point in the case now where things would get tricky, and Dodo knew that if they approached the wrong person, they could lose the whole group, right? They could refuse to talk, clam up, ditch their cell phones, and just completely vanish, and then... Jump on a train to nowhere. Right. And then it's, it's, it's done. So this is where, for me, I think profiling and psychological, like the aspect of police work comes in handy. They knew that they needed to choose wisely. And when Laura called Detective Dotto back during his attempt to reach her, she left a drunken voicemail just rambling on about nothing coherent and whatever. But this is exactly what they were looking for. They were like, ah, okay, this is the one we need to talk to. She's she's a talker, right? Mm -hmm. She's overconfident. She'll chat with us. But when Detective Dotto contacts Laura this time, he just lets her talk. She starts telling her story. John walked away from their group and went his own way, and she couldn't understand why he was listed as a missing person. Midway through their chat, he mentions that John was no longer missing, actually. His body was found. At this turn of events, her tone and her story changes. Three times, to be exact. Oh, gosh. In the same phone call. Oh, yeah. About John and... Whether or not she was with him in Roseville or not, she even admits that she was there, but she said John left with another train hopper named Reno Bryan. Okay. So this is where Detective Dotto tells Laura that, okay, well, that's fine. We're waiting on DNA evidence. I'll let you know. Right? Mm. So here I have to add, and I don't know about you, but I love it when the police say things like that, even though you know it's not they true. have nothing. <laughs> they scare the shit out of these people. They get them to keep talking and say... Oh, okay, well, you did. Hey, well, in that case. Yeah. You should know. <sighs> right. Totally works. So when she hears this, silence. She then admits, well, I bit him. And now the fourth version of her story comes out. She so bit him? She bit him. Then she starts telling telling him that there was a scuffle and she that she had had with John, and she ends up biting him before he leaves with Reno. Okay. So that's her latest version of the story and I, my flip the script today is that I have two stories that I have to tell you that I had to call my dad and have him retell me the other day so he could so I could get the details right and pass them along but I'm going to keep the tone serious for now I feel like this is something I need to save for later but it's a couple of stories of where maybe the police used a little oh, bit these of are my favorite to get people to talk and I thought I have to share these with you these so are my favorite stay tuned for I the miss end your dad so much I, I know hate you know, he is God, just sitting by the fire listening to his, like, war stories. They're just amazing. They're just so fun. So fun. So a little more digging, and Dotto and Green find out that Reno Bryan is actually deceased as well. He died in a train accident in New York. So now they can't even talk to this guy. That's really what a odd. Coincidence. Right? That's really odd, I'm thinking, at this point, that this guy is no longer with us. Now, remember, the group's phone activity is still being monitored. So as soon as Laura hangs up, Phones start blowing up. Dee, 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 dee. Oh, right. Dee, 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 dee. All over. The detectives now need to know what's being said. They go to, they go back to the attorney general, right? Van Bremen. Try, I told you I'm going to try to keep, keep everybody straight. If you have any questions, let me know. 
But I had mentioned him before, so he steps in and he helps convince the police, the police chief and the police or superior court judge to sign off on a wiretap, which is highly unusual, I guess, for this kind of a wiretap to happen. But apparently it can be done. So here we are. March 25th, 2014, a year later, Dotto and Green are sitting in the parking lot of a Kmart in Farmington, New Mexico, getting ready to surprise Laura Kenner, scary Laura, as she leaves her job. Again, so she has a job at Kmart. She's working, yet she's... So maybe she just took, like... She could be one of those people that can't hold on a job. So she works at Kmart for three months, and she gets money, and then she quits and train hops until her money runs out, and then lands somewhere and... Absolutely. And then, like, meets back up with, like, her people. Yeah. She didn't say much, but she seemed shocked to see the officers waiting for her. And as they left, guess what happened? Phones start blowing up again. And at this time, officers were ready. They were listening in from a wire room back in Sacramento. And I tried to look into that, too. Like, okay, Sacramento, is that close by? Or is that just, like, where you, when you have a wiretap, you have to go through, like, this channel and there's, like, these specific people that have to listen? Like, I don't, I don't know. Interesting. But, yeah. So, we might need to look into more of that later, but. So it was during one such call, Edo called a female friend to let her know that the cops had evidence on the murder he had told her about and that he was going down for it. So he admits freely. Like... The other man in the group, Jules Carrillo, was heard stressing that, and I quote, we gotta disappear with a fucking quickness. The calls continued to roll in, evidence being noted as they basically dug their own graves. So the next day, March 26th, they document another call. Carrillo was heard chatting with a girl, telling her that he's on the run from, and I quote, some serious shit. And this is when he's asked if he killed someone. And he answers, pretty much. So Edo's voice chimes in now, and she asks yet again for the truth. He tells her, Jules, he's referring to Carrillo here, Jules and I buffed up, and that kid doesn't exist anymore, Edo told her. And that was a quote. And then he says, and I quote, so I killed somebody. The girl says, that's crazy. To which he answers, and I quote, not really. I'd kill for you. Like, you've heard me say that. I'm kind of a sociopath. So he's, like, proud of. So he's a cool guy. Yeah. Yeah. So you go to jail. Right. At this point, you can pretty much wrap it up. They have enough for arrest warrants. So Laura goes down first. Farmington police cuff her and take her uh, her in as she walks out of her Kmart job. Meanwhile, SWAT is busting down the door of another home in eastern Nebraska. Guns drawn and ready, they take in Edo and Jules Carrillo. They, get, they take them. They're together. Side. They're together. Ooh. It sounds like they're pretty much together this whole time. Sounds so. like it. Mm-hmm. So Detective Dutto and Green immediately hop on a plane and arrive in Omaha the very next day. Confessions start to come in, fragments, but they're able to you know, piece the story together. When John first met the group outside the bookstore that day in March 2013, Charity Williams, or Agro, the burly tough chick, she says she'll take him under her wing. Uh, The group just basically tells him, you can be our fresh cut, which is train lingo for first-time writer. So they're going to, like, take him in and show him him the ropes. Show him the ropes. So the days they spent together at first, a cheap motel in the valley, scouting out a rail yard in Bakersfield, hopping a freight car in Stockton, doing all the things you would expect, John would report back to his mom and tell her all about it. You know, he'd tell her to stop worrying that he was safe and he was with friends. So the next day, they're in Roseville. The group had some box wine and they walked down to the creek and they were swimming and playing with the dogs for a while. And this is where they also took some of those pictures for Facebook and they posted. And where Williams, aka Agro, posted, in Roseville, being amazing, right? Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. so there you go. Even train hoppers who live off the grid are making sure to post their highlights Oh my gosh, on that's Facebook. so funny. Amazing. <laughs> Seriously. It wasn't until later that night that things took a turn. John was upset by the campfire and he started crying. The investigators believe that it was at this point that he had told the group he was heading back home. I don't know if they thought that he was just going to like hang out with them forever or what the deal was like I don't know what the big deal was he crying again it's all fragmented right and some of it's speculation yeah so yeah so they start yelling at him telling him to stop being a pussy this is when the fight started between John and Laura and she became aggressive and he defended himself and then she bit him she instigated the fight 
and I'm sure, I'm sure she was probably crazy and maybe hurt, trying to hurt him, and he was probably just defending himself. So she bites him, and then the only other thing they can determine for sure after this was that John was attacked by the whole group. They were punching and kicking him in the chest. They said they were, they said they were beating the brake. They were going to beat the brakes off of him. So now they're like train lingo. So beat the brakes off of him. I don't even like so that he's not scared and goes home. Like he's like mm-hmm. going to be in that lifestyle. Maybe I don't know. I don't maybe. know why you're going to beat someone up for wanting to go home. Like just let know. him go. I mean, unless they told him things that they were worried about, or you know, you just at this yeah. point speculation. So Williams at this point is overcooking by the fire and she had recently been in prison for trying to stomp another transient to death in Kansas City. According to other witnesses and train riders, she used to brag about wearing black boots because they don't show blood. At this point, the others had stopped, but John was lying on the ground. He was very badly beaten to the point that he was unrecognizable. He was still breathing, though. Williams and Edo go up to the body. They drag him over away from the others. Meanwhile, Laura and Jules Carrillo thought everything was over. I don't know how you can just be like, oh, everything's over. I'm, they were getting ready to go to sleep. They are getting ready to turn in for the night. Like, okay, well, that happened. Time to go to bed. They Very, just left him there to die? I don't get it. Or they thought he was dead? I'm so confused. Or maybe they thought he would be okay. I, I doubt it. They were like, okay, just another. So it makes you wonder, like, how, how often does this yeah. happen? So Williams at that, you know, then starts shouting that her boots were going to end this. And as John lay on his back, she stomped him to death. So she's the one that Mm. delivers the death blow. And whose account is this? Just a compilation of... A compilation of the group. So remember, Williams isn't in the interrogation room. They don't have her yet. So the group at this point basically said they took off all of his clothing and burned most of his belongings with the rest of, you know, burned most of his belongings, except for the sleeping bag. Williams took that and the gift cards in his wallet and they, they just split those up between them all. And then they dug a shallow grave for him with a dog bowl and they buried him by the creek. With these confessions, the AG had enough to charge all three of them that they had in custody. But with all of them claiming that Charity Ag- Williams, Agro, the burly girl with the boots, was their main killer, they would need to find more evidence. Remember when Laura told the police John had left with Reno Bryan at first mm-hmm. and that she didn't know where he was? So the police start working on this connection. They find out that Reno was really well liked in the train hopper community, like beloved. He was always kind to everybody and like offer, always offered to help, you know, with anything that they would need. I mean, they just everybody really looked up to this guy. So the investigators kept working the train yards, talking to everyone they could. They were able to learn that witnesses said that their group had actually thrown Reno under the train wheels. Mm. So his death was not an accident. No. The witnesses that were disgusted by Williams and what she had done, they came forward and told them that she had actually told them about the beating and giving the death blow that had killed John. So she was bragging about this to these people. And luckily she did because they were able to be witnesses at this point. (sighs) How disgusting. It's awful. Just awful. But at the same time, I'm really glad that they were able to find that. She had a loud mouth. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, luckily. Now they had what they needed. They just needed to find Williams. So she kept her phone off most of the time, kept it powered down, started to head north, and tried to disappear. Fortunately, using geo-tracking technology, the moment that she did turn on her phone for a quick call... They were ready for her. She was hiding in a field in Pierce County, Washington. As soon as she came out and went to a 7-Eleven for a hot dog, they arrested her. Mm. It would be four long years for John's family, but without the hard work of the law enforcement agencies involved, their tireless efforts to bring John and his family justice, honestly, that day may may never have come. Like, they could have been like, who is this John This could have been a very, yeah, they could have written this off very easily. Very easily, and they didn't, and so... Super commendable. I love a story that I can, where I can show the positive things that are happening in law enforcement. So during the summer of uh, 2017, all four pled guilty to charges connected to John's death. Charity Ann Williams, she pled no contest and was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison for second degree murder. Edward Anao, or Edo, pled no contest to voluntary manslaughter and was sentenced to 11 years in state prison. Laura Kenner pled no contest to voluntary manslaughter in 2016, so probably because she was, like, in first. 
and she was also sentenced to 11 years in state prison. And then Jules Carrillo pled no contest to assault with a deadly weapon and with force likely to cause bodily injury. He was sentenced to four years in state prison as well as three years for a special allegation of causing great bodily injury. So I don't know how they separate these charges, right? No, they're still not enough. I'm not satisfied. It's not enough. I definitely wasn't satisfied either. And it was said that Jules Carrillo was the only one that showed remorse. And he said that John was a really sweet little kid. The others didn't ever mm. make it seem like... They didn't care. They didn't care. They're going to get out and jump a train and do it again. Yeah. Well, and you know that they are because they're not going to be in there forever. No. Well, Williams had already gotten out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it a, it's a cycle. It's a, it's it's a process. Stopping. It's stopping. It's like a, the same exact thing. Yeah. So, again, yeah. When it happens again, how many times does it need to happen mm. for them to stay in prison? Like, you're done. Yeah, I agree. So during the trial, Josh and his family read statements. They were talking about the unforgettable life stolen from them. I mean, they talked about an amazing brother, son, and friend. I can't even imagine. Like, this was something that I, honestly, it broke my heart anyway. But as a twin, Mm -hmm. losing your other half this way, Josh said, and I quote, I can't glance in the mirror without seeing him. And some days I choose not to even look in the mirror at all. I'm sure it's just a constant reminder to him of what he lost. And every time he sees himself, he sees what his brother would have looked like as he grew older with him. You know, it's just Mm -hmm. such a heartbreaking thing. And I'm sure for his family. To see it. To see. Every time they see him, they think of, of his brother. My heart goes out to Josh and his family. Just so sad. As the letters were being read and the prisoners were being sentenced and taken away, Dutto was there in the courtroom, sitting in the back, and I read that Green was on assignment and couldn't make it. But when interviewed, and I thought this was really important to put in, he said, and I quote, It's weird. It's mixed feelings. You put so much time into an investigation and some of the things you try to work and sometimes you also get lucky and ultimately you're able to try to do something for the family. But the reality is you don't want to be here the end of the day you just wish none of this had ever happened i could see that yeah i'm sure it's very much like that i mean at the end of the day you can bring these assholes to justice but you don't have the power to bring back the dead which is what you really wish you could do mm-hmm. and it's just not, i could see she's not, not having fair. actual closure from it mm-hmm. yeah so that's that's my story it was good yeah did you was it that was not what i expected at all i was not expecting that story I like yeah. to be surprised. Yeah, yeah. And I was actually shocked that I didn't find it anywhere. Like, I I tried I've never to... in a million years heard of that. Yeah, no, it Not was even... really... it was There wasn't a lot on this one, which is another reason I wanted to talk about it, because I think that spring break is coming up, and there's kids out there that want to do something, and you know what? Make smart decisions. Don't, mm-hmm. don't do something where... And bring a buddy, whatever you're going to do. Don't ever do anything alone. No. You need to have somebody that's going to help you and keep try to help keep you safe and someone you can count on. And Absolutely. I yeah. agree. 100%. No. So I just thought that was really, it was crazy. I mean, we don't have anything like that here. There's no freight trains like down the road. I never, it never even crossed my mind that this was like still a thing. Yeah. yeah. If you have any stories out there about train hopping, please send them in. We want to know. Oh, yeah. You want to hear them? Good idea. So I do have a flip the script. As I promised you, I have some interesting stories. So (laughs) as much as we are talking also about the positives of law enforcement, sometimes we have to bring in a little humor. So this is my, (laughs) this is my (laughs) moment to do that. So, um, if you remember right during the story, you saw detective Dutto tell Laura that he was waiting on DNA evidence, right? And super smart move. They had nothing But she didn't know that. And it really made me think back to a few stories of my dad that he had told me about his days on the force and some of the things that they fudged to get a confession. These stories I could sit and listen to all day long, like all day long. And they're not, you, they can do that, right? Like there's nothing against the law. It's nothing legal. No, it's just, you know, something to speed along the process to save everyone some time, really. I mean, just, they just need a confession, in certain situations, they know they already have everything and they just need And it's to nice something. to hear these ones opposed to like forced. 
Yeah, no, it wasn't. It's not like they beat these people yeah, or did no, anything really. crazy. It wasn't like the lipstick killer where they were doing spinal taps and withholding food and yeah, <laughs> nothing like that. Basically, like, you know, even if you just put a stick in a plastic bag and wave it around and go, I have DNA evidence in this case. And then they're like, oh, my God, I have to tell you the whole story yeah. right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? So okay. it's I think it's it's way more common than you think. So. OK. <laughs> And, and I did, I, again, you're right. So I asked, I was like, dad, you can't get in trouble for any of this, right? He's like, no, God, no, it's nothing like that. He's like, it's just, it's fine. You can tell, you can tell the stories if you want. So I'm like, all right, I will. The first one that I have, they had this, so they had this kid and I call him a kid. He's probably like early twenties, broke into a home, stole something. Dad couldn't remember exactly what it was. He was like, maybe it was TV or something, but he went to the pawn shop in another town, like the next town over and he pawned it for cash. So the pawn shop owner picked him out of a lineup. He was like, yep, that's the one. He brought in the item. I'm sure of it. Okay. So now they, they just need the kid to admit that he, that did, he did it. And they can close the case. So they, <laughs> it's a slow day, apparently. Remember, back in the 80s, they call him in and they sit him down in the office. And we have, we have a small police department. So they would have had to hire a professional and pay for someone to come administer a polygraph. Mm-hmm. Right. There was really no need for this. Most of the time, they could just talk to people and they would just get what they needed. So they tell them they're going to give him a lie detector test. No, oh, no. Before he arrived, they printed out a bunch of papers from the copy machine saying truth and lie. And they load it back into the copier, right? Herbert's <laughs> back in the 80s, people may, might not have understood what a polygraph test was like what it was and what it looked like. <laughs> I don't, I, I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. So he gets in that day. They sit him down and they have him put one hand on the copy machine. Okay. That's the lie detector test. Oh my God. So amazing to me. I don't, he's sweating his ass off at this point, right? He's nervous as hell. They ask him a few questions that, that they know he'll get right. Like they ask him, so what is your name? And he would say, da, da, da. Yeah. and they'd be like, okay. Oh, yeah, truth. truth. Truth pops out. Okay. What is your address? You know, da 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 da. Oh, truth. Good. This is going well. Here we yeah. go. And then they get into it, you know, and they, they say, okay, all right. Now we have to ask you, did you break into, you know, such and such as home, steal whatever it was, TV? And the kid says, no, no, I had nothing to do with that, right? His hand's still in the copy machine. They press the button. Oh, lie. Right? So funny. So life pops up. Kids getting more and more nervous. And, you know, they're saying, oh, well, you know, I'm not so sure you're being truthful with us right now. You know, let's try another one. Did you go to, you know, XX pawn shop in Michigan City and pawn the item for cash? So the kids start saying, like, no, no, it wasn't me. I didn't, I didn't do it. Right? Hand on the copy machine. Lie. You know, and they just look at him. And he goes, okay, okay, I did it. And he oh just, like, God. breaks down and he tells the story and they have a confession. And they saved so much money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you, copy machine. I thought that was They'd hilarious. They'd been funny. It was like the copier jammed. Yeah. Just a second. We I don't know if this. they do anything like this to this day. I feel like people are wise enough to know that, like. Oh, not a copy machine. People well, not a copy like, machine, but just some of the other stuff. Like, I just. No. I feel like now people just don't talk. They're like, I plead no. fifth. Like, I have nothing to yeah. say. I get my lawyer. Yeah. I no. don't feel like it's it's no. the eighties. not the 80s anymore. Mm, no. This. The time to fudge these things has has passed. Yeah. Your dad had a had a good time <laughs> mm, while it was to such be such a good time. Seriously, um, but I have another story for you too. This was a little bit less, you know. So he knew this family, right? And the grandfather of the family like calls and says that his granddaughter was hit over the head, knocked unconscious in the park, and someone stole all the money that he had given her to buy food. In this case, after evaluating the situation and speaking with her, he knows right away she's lying. That's not what happened. Uh-huh. And he can see she just that doesn't... That sounds like, suspicious to me, and I'm not even there. Right? I'm like, like it, wait, what? Yeah, yeah. So he's listening to what she has to say, and he's like, mm, not buying it, right? But <laughs> they need to get her to admit yeah. what really happened, or they have to go out and do this huge investigation at the park into this assailant that... Doesn't, doesn't exist. exist. What a waste. Of, you should get in trouble for stuff like so that. So you sh- you can be arrested for that. They, they're they not going to arrest her. They know, you know, they're just going to, 
they're just going to teach her a lesson. So they bring her in and they put her in one of the interrogation rooms. And okay, so you have to picture this. Like there's like this light up on the wall. And this is what they would use in the interrogation rooms. If like, say you're talking to someone, you're trying to, to do your, you know, you're at, you're questioning a, a suspect and the light goes off. They know, okay, I need to go out. I'm going to go and take a break. Do you need any water? Blah, blah, blah. Well, they see the signal that may, that normally that person can't see, but they need to leave the room because maybe they have other evidence. Yeah, or maybe something came have, up and we need to yeah. talk to you. Or, hey, try this line of questioning or ask them about this or whatever. In this case, they show her the light on the wall. And they're like, okay, we're going to give you a lie detector test. So this is, this is just like, a, let's see how many lie detector tests we can come up with in the office. But they're resourceful. <laughs> super resourceful. So they get, they get a little creative and they hand her a microphone. So it's just a microphone. They hand it to her and they go, okay, we're going to ask you some questions. How this works is this device can sense your, um, your body heat, like your body temperature. And so when you're lying, your body temperature rises and then the light turns red. <laughs> so, right. Oh my God. So they got like a couple guys working this, right? Like one's going to work in the light and the other one's asking the questions. And so they hand her the microphone, nothing fancy. And they just tell her, we're going to start now. And they're like, okay, what is your name? She answers her name. And they're like, no, make a check mark on the paper. Okay, good. Truth. And they look up at the light. No, all right. Truth. And then they ask her a few other questions that they know she's going to, that she knows is, is going to be truthful about. And they, oh, okay, all right. And they both, they all look up at the light. She's staring at the light. You know, she's kind of freaking out at this point. So then they ask her, so did someone attack you in the park and steal the money your grandfather gave you earlier that day to buy food? And she says, yes, I was attacked and somebody stole my money. And she's staring at the light. You know, she's looking up at the light and it turns red. She just, she's just kind of like, eyes get real, real wide and she just kind of like looks and she's, she's still staring at it and, you know dad looks at her and he goes okay now it seems to me that you're not being completely honest with me did someone attack you and steal the mon- your money in the park so she's still looking up at the light and she says yes yes that's what really happened you know and the light turns red and she freaks out and she throws the microphone across the room and she's like okay okay oh my gosh. whatever she used it to buy something that she wanted and um yeah. And told her grandfather this whole bullshit story so that he wouldn't be mad at her because she used it to buy like ho hos and yeah. jewelry yeah. and lip gloss or something. Yeah, and fancy smelling shampoo or something. Yeah, you know. And she, and again, like, d- don't imagine like this poor, scared 12 year old girl. Like, she was in her 20s and knew better. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this is like just a situation of like, okay, um, we just need to find out what happened yeah. here. We need to know that you really weren't assaulted. Yeah, we really need to know that there's not some maniac, like, knocking out people in the park and stealing from them oh my gosh. so so yeah those are fun yeah there's probably some other stories that i probably can't share but they're fun too yeah. we'll save those for our campfires yeah campfires only um, well i liked your story and Thanks. i loved your your dad's stories i always do i know Thank you i miss hanging out with dad they'll be up in march but we'll be gone so Hopefully, maybe. Are they like, coming in a couple of weeks? Mm, yeah, actually, they are. Maybe Fun. we can like, all do something or get together. Yeah, yeah. I need to see them. Yeah. I haven't really seen close. them in over a year. Oh my gosh, it's just been too long. The last time I saw them was when we went to uh, CramCon. Oh my gosh. The yeah. cross level event. That was last winter. February, uh-huh. right? Yeah. So it has been a year. Yeah, it's been a year since I've seen them. Oh man. Yeah, we'll definitely have to get together. It's crazy. We'll see if we can get my dad talking. <laughs> Ask him about some other stories. Oh, my gosh. The last time he was in, he was telling the story about how he went in to scope out the house that was supposed to be completely empty. Remember after the break-in? Oh, yeah, the one with his feet in the closet. Yeah, the shoes. and yeah. he goes in and he's he's he looking. He sees all, like, the thick lady shoes and then, like, the yes. big guy shoes. Do yeah. you remember that, that story? story? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, how scary. That's crazy. And it ended up being, like, six foot three, like, huge guy hiding in the closet. Like, yeah. oh, my God. Yeah. And he You're was like, like, it's all clear. Right? Like, there's, like, some fool standing in the closet. Oh, God. I'll clear my even... ass. Get over here and help me. I could not even. <laughs> I'm sure it was hard to keep calm and just go, oh, shit, they're gonna still here. Going to need some help in room down the hall. <laughs> so, but if you're doing anything for spring break, we need to know about it. Let us know. If you have any interesting spring break stories, please Ooh, send yeah, them in. Tell, tell us. Yeah, those would be good, too, to hear. And just be safe. Stay with the buddy. Don't 
don't do anything crazy that you don't normally do on spring break because you're desperate to get out of the house. Like, make good decisions. Yeah. Be safe. Kids stay yeah. home. Yeah. Teenagers, don't go anywhere. Yeah. Don't go anywhere. Like, Mexico and all those places are just scary to me right now. I think I'm just, I think I'm done. And there's a lot of places in the states that I have not seen, so I'm going to, like, hit all those first. I'm going to go to I Montana. Reconsider. <laughs> yeah. All right, so everybody have a good night. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.